Uh, probably the most important job that I have as a part of this church is to do everything I can to make sure that everybody here is ready for a day that is coming in the future for you. It is the transition day when you will transition from this life to the next one. And there is nothing more important than being ready for that day. And that day came yesterday for Shelley, uh, Sherry DeHinden. Sherry, uh, uh, 10 days ago, had a, uh, she had a heart incident. She collapsed uh, as she and Eric were coming out of dinner. Uh, they went to the hospital. She had actually lost consciousness and lost pulse. They revived her um, brain function, heart function. She, her heart was damaged. Her There was limited brain function. And over the last 10 days, she has been uh, sustained, but uh, no sign. She's never come back to consciousness since that collapse. And yesterday afternoon at 5.07, she uh, took her last breath of air here and started breathing celestial air. Um, there will be a memorial service for her at 3.30 on Tuesday at Family Life Headquarters and all of you are welcome to come and be part of that. Uh, but uh, thank you for your prayers for Eric and for Sherry. I talked with him last night and um, reminded him that uh, we grieve in these moments but not as those without hope. And that's our great promise is that uh, in the midst of grief we have hope so uh, continue to pray for Eric uh, this transition is something that no one can be fully prepared for um, Kathy he mentioned to me just how much he appreciated you being out there and just sharing your journey as he's on the same path that you've been on and uh, uh, it is a, it's a hard road but God sustains you in the midst of it so let me pray for him right now. Father, uh, we do pray for Eric, and we pray that uh, this morning your spirit would be comforting him in the midst of his grief and his loss. Thank you for Sherry and her life and her testimony, and for the confidence we have because of her testimony that she is home with you. We pray for Eric's son, Brian. We pray that the events of the last two weeks, you would use them in his own heart to draw him to yourself, and his wife to yourself. And we pray that uh, as we gather to celebrate her life, that your name would be exalted. You would be lifted up and men would be drawn to you. We pray it in your name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bible with you, and I hope you do, we're in Romans chapter 4 this morning as we continue our ongoing study through the book of Romans. I don't know if you're like this, but at our house, if there's a night where you're just channel surfing and you're just seeing what's on, you're not watching what's on you. You're looking for what else is on, right? And there are there are some shows or some movies that if you hit them, it's like you got to stop. You're you're there. I was channel surfing one night and I hit the sound of music, and Mary Ann said, "Oh, it's the sound of music. Let's watch it." And I said, "Honey, we we have the the video with no commercials. We can watch it any time we want." She said, "I know, but it's on now." I don't. But I'm like that too, right? There are some shows that if they're on, you just have to watch them. The one for me that always stops me is a movie that came out 25 years ago this year, came out at Christmas time. It starred Tom Cruise as Lieutenant Daniel Caffey, Demi Moore. Uh, Tom Cruise, by the way, got 15 mil 12 million. Put, put Tom's picture up here. There's Tom as Lieutenant Caffey. 25 years ago, he got $12 million for the movie. Demi Moore only got $2 million for her role as Lieutenant Commander Joanne Galloway. You know the film I'm talking about, right? You watch it. Stefan, same thing stops you dead when it comes on. Also starred Jack Nicholson. He, got, he was in seven scenes. He got $5 million for the movie, okay? Uh, he, he was Colonel Nathan Jessup, and he uttered the immortal line, can we all say it together? You can't handle the truth. Okay, you know, Eric, Aaron Sorkin wrote that line. The thing about the movie, in this movie, the only way that Tom Cruise can win, he's a lawyer, the only way he can win his case is he's got to get his, he's got to get a witness on the stand and he's got to get him to basically confess. 
and and that's exactly what he does. He gets Jack Nicholson to the stand, and under questioning, he gets Jack Nicholson to finally man up and say, "This is what I believe," and he's found guilty. Spoiler alert: in case you were, if you haven't seen the movie, this is what happens: is that Jack says you can't handle the truth, and as a result. Lance Corporal Harold Dawson and Private Loudon Downey are found innocent of murder, but they are still dishonorably discharged from their service as Marines. Of course, the turning point in the movie is that point on the witness stand. I don't know if you're aware, but there was, there was another testimony and witness thing that went on this week, but we're not going to go there, okay? All right? Here, here's the point we're, we're making as, as I think about this movie. We're at a point in Paul's letter to the Romans where he has made his opening statement about the gospel that he believes. He has laid out the case that he's about to make. And in order to win his case, he's got to call to the stand some heavyweight witnesses to be able to testify and support the evidence that he's laid out. So he calls to the witness stand the biggest name in Judaism there is. He calls Abraham, the father of the nation, the most significant person in all of the Old Testament, the man who three times in the Bible is referred to as a friend of God. He calls him to the witness stand and says, Abraham, tell us, how did you become a friend of God? The only way as, as Abraham will testify, the only way that anybody becomes a friend of God is not by working to earn God's friendship, as we read in the Catechism this morning, but instead by trusting and believing that God is who he says he is, having faith in him. So before we look at how Abraham's life and testimony is used to prove Paul's case about justification being by grace alone through faith alone. Let me summarize the argument that Paul has already made in the first part of Romans. First of all, he started out by saying, this is true, God will one day pour out his wrath on all the wicked people. That's point one in his argument. There's a day coming, God's going to pour out his wrath on the wicked. Then the second thing he says is that the Gentiles are proven, have proven that they are wicked and they deserve God's wrath. Then the third thing he says is that Jews, in spite of the fact that they have God's law and they've been circumcised, they are also wicked and deserve his wrath. So you get the point. God's pouring out his wrath on, ever, on all the wicked. Gentiles are wicked. And guess what? Jews are wicked. And there are only two kinds of people in the world. Gentiles and Jews. So God's wrath is going to be poured out on all people. There's a problem here, but God has solved the problem. The only people God's not going to pour out his wrath on are his friends. And to become a friend of God, you have to be a righteous person, Paul says. Well, there's a problem with becoming a righteous person, and the problem is there is no one righteous. No, not one. That's what Paul said in Romans 3, 9. So God's going to pour out his wrath on all but the righteous. His friends must be righteous. Nobody's righteous but God, Romans 3.21. But God has always had a way for an unrighteous person to be counted as righteous. And God's way to do that is for the righteousness of God in Christ to be credited to the account of those who believe. And all who trust in Jesus are justified. They're counted as righteous by his grace. It's a gift given through the sacrificial death of Jesus. So that's Paul's case. Every, God's going to pour out his wrath on all mankind, all of the unrighteous people. Everybody's unrighteous. You're unrighteous. The only way that you can be righteous and become a friend of God is for you to trust in Jesus. That's the conclusion he's come to. See, when God looked at your account, looking for righteousness in your account, he found that you were bankrupt. There, there was not only no righteousness in your account, but there were debts in your account. Your account was not at zero, it was at minus. You had debts you owed and no righteousness to cover it. Now, you may say, wait a sec, I got some righteousness. I mean, I've done some good things in my life, God says, no, what you've done was counterfeit righteousness. 
you tried to deposit righteousness in your account, they held it up to the light and they said, this is counterfeit. There's sin in here. But Paul says, when you realize that your account is empty and that there are debts in your account, that you're bankrupt and you're hopeless, now you're in a position to turn to God and say, I need help. There's nothing I can do. That's the perfect place to be because when men cry out to God like that, he responds with grace and says, I got you covered. And God then deposits righteousness into your account, not righteousness that you earned, not righteousness that you you have anything to do with, but the righteousness of Christ gets po- deposited into your account and your debts get paid. That's the case that Paul has made in the first three chapters of Romans. And here he's saying, this is not just a new idea. I didn't just make this up. This is how it's always been. And to prove that, I would like to call my first witness to the stand, and that is Abraham. In the life of Abraham, Paul says, we're going to see that Abraham understood that he was God's friend, not because he did works that earned him God's friendship, but he was God's friend by faith. So he calls Abraham to support this claim that the way you become a part of the family of God, the way you become a friend of God, is by faith, not by law keeping. This passage, Romans 4, is not a passage that we're going to look at the first eight verses. You read these first eight verses, and this is not something that you go, oh, that's simple, that makes sense. It needs a little bit of explanation. You've got to kind of slow down and dig in. So we're going to do that this morning. But let me give you some kind of some big things that are going to come out This will be what we'll see as we go through Romans chapter 4. The first thing we're going to see is that Paul was confident in the scriptures as the source of authority. You want to know how to become a friend of God, the place to look is in the scriptures. Second thing is, we're going to look at what exactly it means to believe in God. Third thing is, we're going to see how Jesus' righteousness becomes your righteousness, and then we're going to see that God, you you have to recognize that you are ungodly before you can ever receive God's grace and forgiveness. And then because the Old Testament requirement was that if you want to prove something, you can't just call one witness, you have to call two. Uh, Paul is not only going to call Abraham to the stand, but he's going to call David to the stand as well. He picks the two big guys in the Old Testament, the great king of Israel, King David, and the father of the nation, Abraham. And David knows firsthand that God's forgiveness comes by grace because David had that experience. We'll see these ideas as we look at Romans eight, uh, the fir- or Romans 4, the first uh, eight verses. I'm going to read these out loud to you. Before I read the passage, let me pray and ask God to uh, open our eyes this morning. Father, I thank you that we have in front of us this morning your word. Uh, this Bible, this passage, this comes from you. Thank you for the great gift of your eternal word. Thank you that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to obey as we read your word this morning. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Okay, Romans chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. You follow along as I read aloud. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh for if Abraham was justified by works he has something to boast about but not before God for what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness now to the one who works his wages are not counted as a gift but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sin. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word. Now, before Paul takes us to this section where we learn about Abraham and his how he became a friend of God, he has already made three main points in the, in the passage before this, three big ideas, and we looked at these last week. He said, because 
there is no human effort or no human merit involved in becoming a friend of God, you have nothing to boast about if you are God's friend. If you're a friend of God, you have nothing to boast about. You didn't earn that. You don't deserve it. That's the first big idea. And the only way a person becomes a friend of God, whether you're a Jew and Gentile, it's the same for both because there's only one God. There are not two ways to God. There's only one way. It's the same for the Jews and for the Gentiles. And then the last thing that he said in the last passage is friendship with God is a gift that comes to us and that does not mean that the, the Jewish law is now done away with or that it's meaningless. We'll come back to that later. But that's one of the ideas he's got. So we get to the beginning of chapter 4, and he says, I know what you're thinking. What about Abraham, our father according to the flesh? You see, the Jews had believed and taught that the reason that Abraham was a friend of God, which, as I said, he's called that three times in the Bible, they believed that the reason he was a friend of God is because he had done everything that the law required even before it was written. They believed that Abraham had lived a perfectly righteous life. In fact, they taught that he was perfect in all he did and had no need to repent of anything. Now, if you've read Genesis, you know that the writer of Genesis didn't believe that Abraham had nothing he needed to repent of. In fact, there, there are at least two times that we see in there where Abraham's a liar, and he is also an adulterer. He has lapses of faith throughout his life. Abraham's a guy like us. He was not a super spiritual person who never makes mistakes. He's a normal guy who if, if what is required to become a friend of God is perfect obedience and righteousness, read Genesis and it's clear that Abraham fails the test. And yet the Jewish rabbis taught, oh no, Abraham was perfect in his righteous obedience. Now the only way they could get there is you had to dumb down righteous obedience. We talked about that last week. So Paul says at the beginning of chapter 4, if Abraham was justified, and that's, that means becoming a friend of God, when you are justified, that's what happens. God makes you his friend. Abraham did not become a friend of God through law keeping. If he had, he would have something to boast about. I mean, if you became a friend of God through perfect obedience... It's like you took the test and you got a hundred, you got an A plus, you can walk out of the classroom and go, see, see what I did? Abraham did not have a hundred on his test. He couldn't walk out saying, see what I did. In fact, Paul said just a few verses ago, boasting is excluded. There's no place for boasting. So Abraham can't boast about anything, neither can any of us. The family of God the friends of God, that group is not made up of a bunch of spiritual overachievers who can brag about what they did and what they've accomplished. In fact, imagine how insufferable it would be to go through eternity if all of us were simply sitting around going, so what did you do for God? Oh, really? Oh, well, I did this. Well, I, oh, I think what, I, you know, God counted me as his friend because, of that. oh, you did that? Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I mean, if we were just doing that for eternity, that'd be hell is what that would be, Right? That's not in the Bible anywhere. There's nothing that says the way that you become a friend of God is by having a spiritual resume. The friends of God are made up of humble people who realize they haven't earned a thing. Abraham, Paul says, he may have something to boast about. I mean, he is the father of a great nation. I mean, let's give Abraham his due. He's a flawed human being, but he was the father of a great nation. He is the one who received the covenant promises of God. He's a little bit of a Jewish celebrity. He's a hero. He's kind of the George Washington of Judaism. He's a big name. I mean, if he walks into the room, everybody else would go, shh, there's Abraham, right? So he could walk in and go, yes, it's true, I am Abraham. He does have something to boast about in the fact that he's Abraham. But, Paul says, he may have something to boast about, but not with God. He can't walk before God and say, oh, God, do you know who I am? I'm Abraham, right? And God will go, you got nothing that impresses me. So that's the idea here as he says at the beginning, 
Abraham was not justified by works. He didn't have the he didn't have the resume to get him into the friend of God club. He may have something to boast about among humans, but not among God. And then you get to verse 3, and verse 3 is where you see the first of the big ideas in this passage. And the first big idea is that Paul was convinced that the Scriptures were and are the authoritative revelation of God. Paul has called Abraham to the stand, and he's making the case, Abraham was not justified by works, he was justified by faith. How do we know this? He says, for what does the Scripture say? So Paul, to back up his point, says we're going to turn to authority. This would be like in court if you could say, well, let's look at the Constitution here. The Constitution is the document that we have that orders our government. What Paul is saying is I've got no higher authority I can call on but the Scripture, the Word of God. We usually jump past a little phrase like that for what does the Scripture say, but just stop for a minute. The scripture, and by the way, the word there is the word graphe. It just means the writings. What do the writings say? But Paul sees in the Hebrew writings, in the in the, this is the books of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, he sees these writings as not simply being an historical record of the Jewish people. This is not just a historical document. He sees this as being the very word of God. This is God telling his creatures what's what. Paul saw it as true, as authoritative, as reliable, and as trustworthy. And the question is, how about you? Do you see God's word as true, trustworthy, authoritative, and reliable? I think one of the biggest issues that we face in our world today, and one of the biggest issues, probably the defining issue, that separates Christians from non-Christians, that separates professing Christians from authentic Christians, comes back to this. What do the scriptures say? Do you believe that it's authoritative? You go back to Genesis 3. That's the big issue in the garden. Satan comes along and says, has God really said this? And as soon as Eve said, I doubt that what God said is true, all of a sudden she's in trouble. As soon as you say, I have my doubts about what God's word says, you're on the path to trouble. What is more true or authoritative than God's word? Answers nothing. But here's the question. What's more true or authoritative in your life than the scriptures? Fox News, CNN, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, your Twitter feed, or the Bible? What your friends think? Is that more authoritative or the Bible? You see, the problem we have is when we start to think that what the commentators on TV are saying is more authoritative than what the Bible teaches. When what our friends think is more important to us than what God thinks. Six weeks ago, we had the big march for science, you know? It was not really about science. It was about politics, but that's another message, all right? I, I like science. I didn't do all that well in it in school, but I'm glad we have it, right? I'm glad it's there. I think science is true. I trust science. We would not be having this service today if it weren't for an understanding of science. We wouldn't have lights. We wouldn't have sound. We wouldn't have air conditioning. We wouldn't have the drip happening there in the hallway because of that, right? So I like science. I trust science. But listen, I trust the Bible more. And if science and the Bible are saying things that are at odds with one another, then we just haven't understood one of those two things enough yet. Sometimes it's because we haven't understood the Bible well enough yet. Sometimes it's because we haven't understood science well enough yet. I mean, all you have to do is go back about 40 years and you'll find things that scientists were saying were true that today we say, well, that's not true. Marianne and I laugh about this all the time because I will say, now remind me, is soy good for you or not? (laughs) Right? Because 10 years ago, soy was great. Now soy is going to kill you, right? I mean, you can just go, you don't have to go far to find things that science said that people said, this is true, science proves it. And 10 years later, it's like, okay, well, that's not so true. 
like the best thing you can do to eat heart healthy is to avoid butter. No, today that's not true. Now, I'm not sure what that's going to be 10 years from now. I don't know. But I'm eating butter today, I'll tell you, all right? I'm good, for, I'm good with butter. I like it when science lines up with what I want, okay? But I'm starting to think maybe we need a march for the Bible. Maybe we need some people saying that when it comes right do, down to it, what the Bible says is more important and more authoritative than anything else. So is the first question you ask about things is what do the scriptures say? When you're facing an issue in life, when you are dealing with truth, do you ask the question, let, let me ask first, what does the scripture say about this? And notice he says, he doesn't say, what do we read in the scriptures? He says, what does the scripture say? Because for Paul, when you read the scriptures, you're hearing the voice of God. It is God speaking to you. John Stott said, Paul's quasi-personification of the scripture as being able to speak indicates that he draws no distinction between what the scripture says and what God says through it. You read the scriptures, you're hearing the word of God. And songwriter Rich Mullins said it this way. He said, I believe what I believe is what makes me what I am. I did not make it. No, it is making me. It is the very truth of God, not the invention of any man. Paul is calling on his, he's got his top witness on the stand. He's drawing his most compelling source of truth to make his case. So he says, what does the scripture say? The second half of verse 3 is where we find the second big idea in this passage. It's a quote from the Old Testament from Genesis 15, 6, where the Bible says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted or reckoned or credited to him as righteousness. The big idea number two is Abraham became a friend of God by believing God. Now, let me talk just a minute about what it was that Abraham believed back in Genesis 15. Because Abraham had believed God before Genesis 15. But something happened in Genesis 15 where Abraham's belief in God was counted as righteousness. Abraham first believed God back in Genesis 11 when he was living in Ur of the Chaldeans and God came to him and said, get your wife and your kids, pack up and go to a land I will show you. And Abraham went home and said, we're moving. And Sarah said, where? And he said, I don't know. We're going to the land God will show us. Now that's an act of faith. He believed God. He packed up the family and they moved. But the Bible doesn't say in that moment when Abraham believed God, it was counted as righteousness. It just says Abraham did what God told him to do. So there's something more than just doing what God tells you to do that accounts for saving faith. Later, God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to make you some promises. I'm going to promise you that you will be a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I'll, whoever dishonors you, I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Excuse me, that's called the Abrahamic Covenant in Genesis 12. Abraham receives that from God. So what happens in Genesis 15? Well, turn there. Turn to Genesis 15, and let's look at the first few verses and see what is going on in this scene. Verse 15, er, chapter 15, verse 1 says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. So God comes to Abraham, he says, don't fear, I'm going to protect you, you'll have a great reward. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram said, behold, you've given me no offspring, a member of my household is going to be my heir. We've got a problem, God, you promised to bless the nations through me, I've got no kids, Everything I have is going, to get, is going to be left to my butler, Eliezer of Damascus. Verse 4, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. This was a clear pitch black night in the 
fields outside in, in Judea, when, they, when he looked at the stars, you ever been out there in one of those nights where the stars are just, it's like they flood the skies? That's what Abraham was looking at. He couldn't count the stars. And that's the point. God says to him, your offspring are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And then it says, Abraham believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So something happened that night. He believed something. Here's what he believed. He believed that night that the blessing of God to humanity was going to come through his seed, through his offspring. He believed that God would give him a son who would be the one who would bring the blessing to all people. He believed a Messiah was coming. And when he believed that God's plan for blessing humanity would come through a person, he believed the gospel. And that was counted to him as righteousness. He didn't know Jesus' name. He didn't know if it was going to be his son Isaac or his next son Jacob. He didn't know who it was going to be. He just knew that God was going to bring, and he believed that God was going to bring to him an offspring. In other words, he believed in the son of promise, that God's promises would come to pass through the son of promise. He believed the gospel. Now, when I say he believed the gospel, we have to understand what belief looks like, what it means. Belief, the, the reformers said it this way. The reformers said there are three things that make up saving faith. In order to have saving faith, your belief has to include three things. First of all, it has to have knowledge. You have to know the facts. You can't believe something that you don't know, so you have to know the details. Second, it has to have assent. You have to agree that the facts are true. And then third, there has to be trust. You have to trust that what is promised will come to pass. Knowledge, assent, and trust. Let me, let me do a demonstration. I'm going to need a volunteer, somebody who's under the age of 10 who is willing to volunteer. Is there somebody here who is willing to do that? My granddaughter, Rosie, is willing to do that. Come up here, Rosie, if you would. Rosie's here from Indiana. Step right up here. Thank you for being a volunteer. I didn't see you raise your hand, but you're okay doing this, right? All right. Okay. So I'm going to ask you some questions about this. What is this thing right here? Chair. It is a chair. Very good. How do you know it's a chair? That's a good question, isn't it? Right? That's called epistemology. You'll learn about that later. We won't get into that right now, okay? How do you know it's a chair? You know it's a chair because you've grown up being taught that this is a chair. You believe it has the characteristics of a chair. It fits the model of what a chair should look like, right? Okay. So you believe in the... Do you believe this chair actually exists? Do you believe it's really here? It's not just... You're not just imagining it. It's, it's a real chair. Is that what you believe? Okay. Rosie believes in the reality of the chair. She's not there yet. Do you believe that you could stand up on this chair and it would hold your weight? Yes. Do you believe that G-Daddy could stand on this chair and it would hold his weight? Yeah, that's a different... <laughs> Rosie's a smart girl, isn't she, right? Do you think? You think I could stand on this chair and it would hold my weight? Let's see. Is it doing it? Is it holding my weight? Yes. You believe that this chair can hold my weight? Yes. Okay, all right. Do you believe it can hold your weight? Okay, now Rosie not only believes in the chair, she believes this chair could hold her weight. She's not there yet. Is this chair currently holding your weight? Oh, it's not currently holding her weight. Would you like to step up on the chair? Now, is this chair holding your weight? Basically, yes. Do, do you believe that if you jumped up and down on this chair, it would continue to hold your weight? Maybe, yes. It would, okay? If I did it, maybe not. But you, it'll, it would hold. But we're not going to test that part out. But this chair is now holding your weight, right? You believe it can do that? And if you continued to stand on this chair, you believe it would continue to hold your weight, right? Yeah, okay. Now Rosie has gone from believing in the existence of the chair 
and believing in what the chair can do to actually trusting the chair. She got up here. She's standing here by herself. She has confidence that this chair not only can but is holding her weight. Would you thank Rosie for our help? Thank you. You may step down. You can go back to your chair. That will hold your weight. Okay, here's the point. There's a difference between believing that there is a God and believing in what God might be able to do and actually stepping into God and saying, I'm going to trust you to do that for me. That's saving faith. Saving faith comes when you step on the chair. An old story that's told about a guy who used to walk across a tight wire at Niagara Falls. Every day he would get up in the morning, he would, there's a tight wire, this is made up, this didn't, didn't really happen, but the, the, imagine, tight wire across Niagara Falls. This guy would get up and he would give you free rides on his shoulders across Niagara Falls. You'd get a spectacular view of the falls you couldn't see from anywhere else. He would carry you on his shoulders. He did this every day for 10 years, never slipped, never lost anybody. If you saw that, if you heard about that guy and heard that that was true, you would go, that sounds unbelievable. But if you had enough witnesses, you might go, okay, I guess it must be true. Then if we stood there and you watched him do that every day for three months, never slipped, never had anybody, you would go, I guess that guy can really do that. But then if I came to you and said, so you ready to get on his back? That's a different kind of faith, isn't it? You see, You'll hear people all the time talk about all you have to do is believe in Jesus. Well, a lot of people think, well, what that means is I just have to believe he exists. No, it's more than that. Well, I just have to believe that he could save me. No, it's more than that. You have to trust him to actually be saving you now. You have to put your weight on him. You have to get on his back and walk across the tight wire with him. That's what saving faith looks like. That's the kind of faith Abraham had that night in the, in the darkness. It wasn't a perfect faith. Abraham's faith wasn't a perfect faith. Yours doesn't have to be a perfect faith. Your faith will waver. Abraham's did. That's why Ishmael was born, because Abraham's faith wavered. But you have to have the kind of faith that says, I don't just believe this in my head. I believe this in my heart, in my hands, in my feet. That's what saving faith requires. If you don't have a faith that reshapes your life and your actions, you haven't yet really believed. It's not enough to believe that God exists or that the gospel is true. The devil believes those things. You have to believe that your life needs to be different as a result. You have to turn from old paths and you have to follow Jesus. When Romans 4.3 quotes Genesis 5.16 and says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, the kind of faith it's talking about, the kind of belief it's talking about is a belief that says, okay, I'm going to trust that what you say is true and my life is going to be reshaped as a result of that. That's the kind of faith necessary for a man or a woman to be justified and become a child or a friend of God. A number of years ago, Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a pastor in Philadelphia, he pastored a 10th Presbyterian church there. He was talking to a man about the gospel. And in the conversation, going on for a long period of time, the man seemed to be in total darkness. Finally, in a moment of desperation, the man said, what does God want? Just tell me, what does God want? And Barnhouse in what he thought was a moment of divine inspiration at the moment, he said, God wants to be believed more than anything else. God just wants you to trust him, to believe that everything he's promised is true. I mean, in a healthy relationship, we trust each other, don't we? God just wants you to believe that what he says is true. And in that moment, that man said, oh, I, I think I see. After all, the honor of God is involved now, isn't it? See, he understood God has said, this is what I will do. His honor is involved. And that man believed in Jesus at that moment. God wants us to believe him and to trust him. Can you be a friend of God if you don't believe him and trust him? No. Which brings us to the third big idea in this passage. When Abraham believed God, God gave him a gift. The gift God gave him was that gift of righteousness so that he could become a child of God. God deposited into Abraham's account in that moment righteousness. It was counted to him. That's, a, that's an accounting term. Uh, legizomai is the Greek word there. It's an accounting term. It means to credit. I 
dropped my bookkeeping, my accounting course that I signed up for in college. Only class I dropped throughout college was accounting. I sat in there for about four or five weeks. I said, this class is not for me. I mean, I was accruals and debits and credits, and I, I just, it was not, I wasn't getting it. So it was too complicated. LIFO and FIFO, you know, you know what I mean? Last in, first out, anyway. But I do know how to follow my checking account online, okay? So I can look at that and I can tell in this column is the money I've spent where I've, I've paid things to people. And in this column is the deposits I've made. And it's always better when this column has more in it than this column does, right? Paul has been using this accounting language. In fact, he uses legizomai five times in six verses here. And here's what he's saying. Your bank account, Abraham's bank account, had zero, had a negative balance. Zero righteousness and debts were included. And God transfers to him everything he needs to cover not only his debts, but also to give him the righteousness required in order to become a friend of God. And where did that deposit come from? Well, verses 4 and 5 in, in Romans 4 tell us it's not because he earned it, because if he earned it, it wouldn't be a gift, it would be a wage. He cannot go to God and say, God, I did this, you owe me fork it over. No, he comes to God and says, I, I haven't done anything. God says it's a gift. Now, some people think, again, I've done some good works, but they were counterfeit good works. Can't be both a gift and an entitlement. Believing the gospel means that you have to abandon your reliance on or your trust in any righteousness of your own, any good works of your own. You, we want to desperately cling to the fact that, wait, I did something. Believing the gospel means you've got to let go of that. You've got to let your fingers go of that. We, you give up trying to earn his love or his attention. You give up on that pursuit because it doesn't work. You rest in the fact that because it's a gift, God's love and attention will be yours as a blessing, as a free gift. He gives us that blessing. It's counted to you as righteousness. So the question for us this morning is, are we clinging to any hope of our own? Are we clinging to any idea that the debt we have, we can somehow repay? That God owes you a blessing because you did your good deeds this work? week. I mean, in the back of our mind, we do have this thought that if we just do what we're supposed to do, that's going to insulate us from trouble. And, and then trouble comes along and you go, wait, that's not fair. I've been, try I've been trying to do, I've been trying to be a good person and God makes this happen. That's works righteousness thinking. Do you think because you were kind to somebody today, God owes you something? Do you think that because you went and visited the nursing home, you should get a blessing other than the blessing you get from visiting the old folks in the nursing home. You, God should somehow go, well, you did a good thing. I'm going to give you a deposit today. That's not how it works. You had a quiet time every day this week. Do you think, okay, I did my quiet time. I didn't miss a day. Therefore, I deserve something. See, that's how our thinking works. I, I wrote a bigger than average check to the church. Now, actually, that does count. for. No, I'm kidding. That's just kidding. Listen to what the hymn writer says. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all could for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. You heard about the two frogs who jumped in the milk pail? You ever heard this story? Two frogs jump in a milk pail, and they're drowning in the milk. They can't get up. There's nothing to get up. They're just drowning in there. And so one of them just goes, it, it's, we're hopeless, it's over, we're dead, and he just dies. He just falls to the bottom of the milk pail dead. The other one starts thrashing around in there and goes, I'm a, <clears throat> i got to get out of here some way. And he thrashes and thrashes and thrashes, and he does it long enough that he starts churning the milk into butter. And as soon as he churns it into butter, now it's solid. He can get on it and he can hop out of the milk pail. Okay? A lot of people think that's how the Christian life works that you're stuck in the milk pail and if you'll just work hard that God will give you some solid land you can jump out no 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 it's not how this works you don't keep working hard to earn hope we have hope because of what Christ has already done you don't solve your righteousness deficit problem by continuing to thrash around in life and hope that some butter comes under your feet 
Your problem is solved when God reaches into the pail of milk and he rescues you. Okay, last point. And this is King David in verses uh, 7 and 8 here. Paul calls David to the stand. Big idea number four, when God gives you the gift of righteousness, he gives you a second gift along with it. Not only does he credit your account with righteousness, but he pays all your old debts. Your sins are forgiven. They're not, they're covered over. They're not counted against you anymore. Along with the good news, when you believe and trust in God, God gives you that huge deposit of righteousness, but he also says, I'm going to pay all your old debts. Canceled, forgiven, covered over. The second gift, you remember David. David was not a perfect man either. He was a man after God's own heart. But he was also a man who in one chapter of his life was pretty good at violating some of the Ten Commandments. He coveted, and then he committed adultery, and then he committed murder. Kind of right there all in one big... And and he thought he'd kind of gotten away with it until his friend Nathan comes and says... Everybody knows what you did. You're the man, and David is busted, and he's broken before God. And if you want to read the account of his brokenness, you go to Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, and he talks about confessing his sin. And and so David understands this issue, what it is to have sin, but he also understands what it is to have your sin forgiven. And, And... he, there are two words used here for the different kinds of sins. I'll say this quickly. There is the word anomai, antinomianism. There's the word that where he says one kind of sin is that sin against the law, where I do what I shouldn't do. There's another kind of sin, and that's harmart, I, I can't say it, harmartii, which is the sin that where we say we don't do what we're supposed to do. There are two kinds of sins we have in our lives. When we do what we shouldn't do, that's one kind of sin. When we don't do what we ought to do, that's another kind of sin. David says both of those are forgiven in Christ. Doing the wrong thing and failing to do the right thing, both are forgiven when God gives you the gift. In fact, I'll wrap up this, this section, I'll wrap up this message with this great quote. This, I love this quote from Psalm 51. Here's David, he's writing this this song, which is his song of confession and his rejoicing in the fact that his sins are forgiven. And he says in Psalm 51 at verse 14, he says, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Blood guiltiness means I'm guilty of the murder of somebody else. Deliver me for the penalty I deserve for having murdered Uriah. O God of my salvation, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Look at this. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or else I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. Now, didn't God tell you, if you sin, go do the sacrifices? Yes. But here's David saying, but I get it now. It's it's not the sacrifice you want, God. He says, in fact, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. David got it. He understood that the sacrificial system was there to point you to something else, which is the grace of God. He says, I understand it's not the sacrifices that earn me anything. What God wants is a broken and contrite spirit. He wants me to come before him and confess my sin. Have you done that? Have you confessed your sin to God? Have you trusted him to give you the good gifts of righteousness and forgiveness? And are you resting in that? Not not just have you once stood on the chair and now you've hopped off and you're run around on your own but is your life lived on that chair is that an ongoing practice of your life this table behind me is a picture of what it cost God to be able to pay the debt we owe and to be able to give us the righteousness the the bread and the juice represent the body and the blood of Jesus the body of Christ He lived his life in perfect obedience and earned for us the righteousness required to become a friend of God. And then that's transferred to our account when we believe. The blood of Christ is the price paid through his death for forgiveness of sins. Our sins are many with no way to pay for forgiveness. He pays it through his blood. This table represents for us what Abraham believed, that the perfect righteousness of Christ and the forgiveness of sin is found in God alone, not in human effort. And as you come to the table this morning, that's what you're confessing, that you believe that as well. 
that your sins are covered over and the righteousness of Christ is accounted to you because of what Christ did. Let me say something to those of you who are here as visitors. We practice what we call open communion here, which means that this table is open to any who can say, I have put my trust in Christ. I have abandoned all hope of trying to save myself. My only hope is in Him, and my life is committed to Him. If you're here this morning and that's your testimony, you're welcome at the table. If you're here this morning and you're not sure about that, I'd like to talk about that. I'd love to talk to you after the service. I'd love to answer any questions you might have about the message this morning or talk about what it means to be a friend of God and how you achieve that through believing in Him, not through anything you do. So let's talk about that after the service. We're going to take a time here for those who are Christians to come down the outer aisle to receive the bread and the juice. You'll go back through the center aisle, take them to your, t uh, your seat with you, and we'll take communion together. Uh, if you're here this morning and you're you're unsure about any of this, you're not a Christian, rather than just coming and receiving this stuff, just think about what you've heard this morning and maybe just spend some time in prayer and, uh, and then we can talk after the service if you'd like to do that. You prepare your hearts while I prepare the table. this morning.
Jesus on the night before he was crucified, had the Passover meal with his disciples. He took the bread. He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you receive it, remember me. He tore it. He passed it. So, Lord Jesus, this morning we do remember you. We remember your perfect obedience lived throughout your life. We remember that you earned the righteousness we could not earn. And you transferred it to us when we believed that your righteousness becomes our righteousness so that we can be friends of God. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. In the same way, when the meal was completed, Jesus took the cup. After he'd prayed a blessing, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. And so, Lord Jesus, we remember your sacrifice. We remember that your blood was shed in our place, that your death paid the debt for our sin. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. If you'll stand, we're going to sing together. Let's just sing that You Alone Can Rescue. Just sing that chorus together. And, uh, and then we'll be dismissed with a benediction. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You will dream to let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, abide in peace. Amen. Amen. We'll see you tonight at 6.30 for ice cream and the movie. <laughs>